as a people with one song, with one voice, we're a nation undivided and poised. We will take a stand and build a land in faith to defend what is ours. Mrs. Iasele, please could you give us an opening prayer? A short word. Praise, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can we close our eyes? We're in the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Almighty God. Father, we thank you for this gathering today. Thank we you. thank you because we know even before we got even to, into this scene, scene, you're already here. Thank we pray, you. Lord, you take total charge and total control of all that will take place today. That the mm -hmm. teachings that we're going to give and all the counsels that will come forth from the speakers and even the chief speaker, Lord, oh my God, I pray that it will not fall into deaf ears in Jesus' name. That, Lord, mm -hmm. oh my God, will get results from all that we'll do today. This will not be, oh, Lord, oh my God, one teaching, oh, Lord, oh my God, that will not bring results. Father, will say, take all the glory. We pray, Lord, and my God, for all the devices, O oh Lord, to work perfectly to our favor, even within this period of the conference, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, because we know you have answered. Thank you. In Lord. Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. Morning. That was a lovely rendition of our national anthem. Um, Happy New Year to you all. I'm so glad that I could bring my New Year's gift to you all, Nation Builders, and you're all very welcome. Um, I am a Nigerian by divine design, Fumi Olaore, ED of Save a Child, Save a Nation Foundation. At, uh, so it's Saxon for short. At Saxon, we believe that the richest resource of every nation is, is, the, is the next generation incubating in the national womb. And if we neglect that next generation, we are, that it's an abuse of the future. So that's why to change the future, to have the kind of future we envision for our country, Nigeria, we have to start making an impact on our young children. And that is the essence of us as nation builders, teachers, parents, mentors in different areas that affect our children one way or the other. We need to work together to make that difference in the lives of our children. And hence the, the need for our conference. This is the very first one that I'm holding. I do lots of workshops with children. I've been doing that for since um, for about six years. So we do workshops, excursions, talk with the professionals and things. But I can only see them once in a while, maybe once, once or twice in a year. But the teachers, the parents, you see them every time. So that's why it's, it's necessary that we come together to work together and, and make that, uh, and make that um, change, make that impact on the lives of our young children. So this morning, our theme is career aspirations and the future of work. And what's the role of mentors? I won't be talking alone. If I had two hours to speak, I'm sure everybody will fall asleep. So I have lots of experts here with me who are going to share their wealth of experience as we talk on this matter. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Akanimo Odon. After he has spoken, then I'll have an opening question for each of our speakers. And I, have, I, I actually have some polls as well that our participants will take part in so that we hear from you, we feel the polls. Uh, when you have any questions or comments to make, regarding whatever a speaker has said, please send a chat and, and we'll, we'll read it as we go along. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our, um, our keynote speaker, Dr. Akanimo Odon. Just a minute. Dr. Akanimo Odon is an international business and strategy development expert who has gained experience working in several capacities to several global international and international bodies with a specialization in education and training, energy and environment, oil and gas, media, charities and governments. He has an in-depth understanding of global issues, but with special reference to Africa. He's also a reputable education consultant specializing in the design of new innovative transnational education schemes to increase educational access to Africans driven by strategic partnerships. He is an international multi-award winner, a seasoned author and writer, the founder of different successful Africa development initiatives and programs. His links and networks spread across over 30 African countries and his working relationship with a wide range of international bodies makes it easy for him to realize his professional goals. His goal and ultimate professional mission is to help overseas bodies, firms and individuals get a good entry, settlement and capture of the African market and for African bodies and organizations to grow and establish themselves in the international market. Join me as we welcome Dr. Akanimu Odon. Good morning, Doc. Thank you very much. Uh, an absolute, can everybody hear me clearly? Yeah? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure to be here. And thanks for welcoming me to the Parent and Teacher Conference. And Thank you, sir. I was particularly struck by the theme, career aspirations, and the future of work, but in specifically the role of mentors. And 
or you've given me only 10 minutes. I'm not used to speaking for 10 minutes, so I'm going to try my <laughs> best. Really, really hard. <laughs> so, so I've, got, I've got too many things ro- ro- I mean, ro- running in my head. So to kind of condense the 10 minutes, it's a bit of a hustle, but I'll try my best. Don't worry. So maybe I'll start yeah. with this though. So between January and February this year, that's before the lockdown, I did seven African countries, okay, in two months. And then the lockdown happened in March and we're stuck. So as I was speaking to you, I'm speaking from my cold lockdown office at home in Lancaster in the UK. Okay? <laughs> now, so now my job involves traveling an awful lot. If you look above me, what you can see is a little frame, right? Yeah, so that's a frame of currencies. I can move my laptop. On my right-hand side is another frame of other currencies. So there are about 37 African currencies because of the 37 countries I did just two years ago. And so I kind of said, well, I'll pick up every, every African currency, every country I go to over the year. Now, as Fumi was speaking, she kept saying Africa, Africa, Africa. And it might surprise you to realize I'm actually Nigerian, but she never mentioned the word Nigerian. And that's the reason why. And I want to make it a very, 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 very good point. So this year, because of the lockdown, I moved all my training programs online, okay? And I'd written a book, I'll show you. So I wrote this book and the book is called The Graduate Code. Now, the premise of the book is, in every professional, follow me, it's a student wanting to learn. And in every student, it's a professional waiting to earn. Think about that for a minute, okay? Is 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 the premise of the book. And so, the world of work is, everything has changed. And so I was doing lots of online training. So I remember as a matter of fact, if I did a count between uh, April this year and say uh, November, I trained over 1,000 school owners and teachers and parents from at least 20 African countries, okay? But, and I did that from my room, from my office space, okay? And something struck me very clearly. When I was speaking with many teachers and many parents and individuals, what kept coming true was the fact that there was frustration. Uh, COVID had uh, kind of uh, impacted on people's jobs and people couldn't pay salaries. But might it surprise you to realize that in the midst of the chaos, follow me, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the troubles and people complaining about jobs, they couldn't pay salaries, was when I decided to start my own school. As a matter of fact, I just set up a school in Iba, in Lagos, literally this month. And that school opens at the end of the month. So why would I set up a school when everybody's running away from setting up schools? That is because I think about things differently. Every organization, every corporation, every institution, by default, you are designed to solve problems. There is no problem, there is no opportunity, there is no solution or creativity. And so I remember I woke up one morning and on CNN, there was um, a, a, a news item that was in April last year. And an American couple were having a wedding, follow me? And, and the wedding was virtual wedding. So the person playing the piano, the, the priest who were there, them, they were all in different locations. And so they figured out a way to still hold a wedding in the midst of lockdown. Problems create a basis for opportunities. I must as well go as fast telling you that problems are the raw materials for opportunities. Problems are assets for creativity, for innovation. That's absolutely crucial. And so I remember some several years ago when I traveled across different African countries, and uh, if I'm flying from, say, Amsterdam to Nairobi in Kenya, or if I'm flying from Amsterdam to Lusaka, Zambia, I always realize that the number of non-Africans in the flight is a, 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 a lot less. In the last two, three years, I started realizing that the number of non-Africans in flight going into Africa just kind of quadrupled. I remember taking a flight from Amsterdam to Nairobi where over 80% of the passengers going into Africa were white. And I'm wondering, what are they doing in Africa? And it's very strange. When you ask the non-African, why do you keep coming to Africa? What they will tell you is this. They'll tell you, well, Africa is where it's happening. Africa is where the money is. Africa is where there's huge opportunities for success. But when I ask my African brothers and sisters and say, well, what is happening in Africa? They tell you, ah, only government of way, nothing is happening. Everything is useless. So why the African is trying to leave Africa overseas, the non-African is coming into Africa. And so I started investigating, why do they come to Africa? I surprise you. The re- simple reason is because Africa is blessed. And I use the word blessed advisedly. 
Africa is blessed with problems. When you wake up in the morning, okay, and look around you, if you understand that problems are assets for opportunities, problems are the raw materials for opportunities, it has a huge impact on your career aspiration and your career growth. It's a fundamental basis. And so I thrive in the midst of problems. I want to wake up in the morning and tell myself, I can today. May you find problems because when you do and you're able to provide solutions to those problems, therein lies your differentiation, therein lies your activation. Fundamental point. And so as an individual, as a professional, the question is very simple. What problems are you solving? If you are not solving a problem, you are going to be remain, I mean, you will remain more moribund. If you're not solving a problem, you will become old school pretty soon. So fundamental point one, what problems are you solving? Number two, okay, who are you? Now, why is that important? Uh, I, I, I liked uh, the way Fumin uh, introduced herself. She says she's, she's Nigerian by design. I like that. And I'll tell you why that's the case. Why is that important? What is your design? So I, I, I'll, do, I'll do a very small example. So I, I like people to respond to me quickly. If I tell you, the word lion, that's the animal, lion. Can you write for me in the chat section which phrases or words come to your mind? Let's go. So when I say lion, write in the, in the chat section what phrases comes to mind. I want to make a point. Let's go. Come on. So describe a lion. What phrase comes to mind? I'm waiting. I have only 10 minutes. Don't eat my time, Biko. Please. <laughs> when I say lion, someone wants to tell me in the chat section Thank you, thank you for bringing me. Fearless, bold, that's good. King of the jungle, Lizzie says roar. Fearlessness, Aidy says fearlessness. And Prophet Allah says strong. Okay, we can stop. Now, I want to make a point to you. This is very, very important. Because once you get this, things are easy. Follow me, okay? Now, what if I told you that a lion is the laziest animal or one of the laziest animals in the animal kingdom? Would you believe me? That surprised you. But that's true. Because a, a male lion, an average male lion, sleeps and snoozes for over 20 hours a day. Hello? If you are in this room and you sleep for 20 hours a day, which word should we describe you as? Talk to me. Eh? It cannot be bold, can it? That word to describe a man or woman who sleeps every day for 20 hours, the word cannot be bold. That is lazy at its best. But get the point I want, I want to make here. It doesn't matter that the lion sleeps for 20 hours a day. Because the two or three hours that the lion is active, the lion is, at the, is, is, is the best at what it does. It's so good at it that it's boldness and efficacy in those two, three hours in the day consumes the whole 20 hours it was lazy, which is the reason why none of you describe a lion as lazy. What's my point? By design, a lion roars. You might train a parrot to roar, but there's going to be trouble with vocal cords. And so what is your design? In careers, people don't understand that it is easy for you to do what you have been designed to do as against what you force yourself into. And so for career progression, the fundamental question is, what are you good at? And I've captured it in my new book. It's called The Career Pre-Code. And I want to quickly run through the seven key questions, seven key questions that tells you your positioning in respect to your design. Because if you are doing someone else's work, you will struggle. Do your own. It's like me. My first degree was in environmental rehabilitation. My second degree was environmental management. My PhD was environmental management. I am the Baba of environment. But what if I told you right now, I don't do anything remotely environmental? What would you say? Because nobody told me how to capture my design. Now I can speak for Africa. You can tell even, 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 even the way I'm speaking, you can tell I'm enjoying it. Are you following me? What is your design? So seven questions to ask yourself to know your positioning. Number one, do you do that thing you do with ease? Number two, 
Do you remember when you knew you could do it? Chances are you haven't remembered. Number three, do you remember learning it in the first place? Chances are if there's something you are naturally gifted by design, you can't remember learning it. But the more you study about it, the more you do it, the better you get. Number four, do you, do you get better at it the more you do it? Yes, you do. Number five, will you do it for free? You see, so I'm speaking to you. I will speak for free. But then when you are paid to do what you are naturally good at, it's the best kind of job. Number six, do you feel happy when you are doing it? Many people work for 10 years of their life and they are making so much money, but they are never happy. Find out what makes you happy. And number seven, do you think, follow me, there's a potential to make others happy when you do it enough for them to pay you. That is when you align your, 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 your fundamental features and skill sets with what the market needs. So what, who are you? Are you a lion? Are you a dog? Are you a sheep? Are you an eagle? What is your design? Okay, now, now that's who are you? Then number three question, what you have? Everybody has time. You have resources. Maybe a good way to put the picture is this. And this is important because I'm speaking in a parent just conference. And what your role as a parent is. In my, in my, in my course, I design my online course. It's called a deed pathway. And D is what? D for discovery, E for empowerment, then the second E for enhancement, the last D for distribution, the D pathway. Because when you understand it, then everything becomes simple for you to flow into. What do I mean? My daughter, Kayla, she's 12 now, okay? At the age of three, I remember the, the music came on, the music came on, and she started dancing, okay? But it wasn't so much the dance that was the interesting thing about Kayla, my daughter. It was the fact that she was dancing in rhythm. So that means if you increase the tempo of the music, she would increase the, the movement of her feet. Are you following me? And then by the age of five, she says that I want to write a book. I write a book. How now? Okay, we'll write the book. By the age of six or seven, she says I want to, she wants to paint. As she progresses as a father, I can see her design is in the arts. If you compare her to my son, my son wakes up in the morning, I mean, he's nine now, and he will spend three, four hours watching documentaries about the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 about the solar system. He would try, try to figure out how do they design computer games. So as a parent, I can tell that his design is in engineering. Now, as she progresses, you discover that doing those kind of arty things, my daughter comes easy, dancing music, drawing. She's fluent with words. She picks up a, no matter how voluminous, she'll finish the book in three days. She's in that space. Now, won't I be a, an evil father to compel her to go and study medicine? I, I tell people, I said, the next, when you hear that I ask my daughter, who I have confirmed that her design pathway is in the art, if I, you, you hear that I made her to go and study medicine, Please arrest me, call the police on me. So what is the role of parents and teachers? Your role is to help discover the design pathways in those children. You know, it's, it's the reason why many people grow up in their lives and they go into a profession, a career progression pathway that they're never supposed to be. But what's the funny and interesting is this, if you ask individuals, what makes you happy? You'll be surprised that most people know what makes them happy? And so I believe that a university is supposed to be an environment where you are empowering children in what they've already discovered. My first degree was in University of Benin. I studied zoology, the study of animals. Meh, meh. I don't even like animals. I mean, I, mean, I don't mean that in, in, in a bad sense. What am I doing with lions and tigers? But I studied that course for four years. Meanwhile, when I was studying zoology, I knew I love writing. I love playing with words. Imagine if I realized that I was able to develop my capacity in what was my design pathway, my innate skill and gifting, then things come easy. How you, do you understand your positioning? 
I want to finish here because I think I'm, I'm way past them. I'll probably leave it to, 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 maybe to an open room. In the world we live, okay, we live in an, in an environment where everything is globally connected. Okay? And interestingly, many people struggle because they, are, they have restricted themselves. Some seven years ago, my title on LinkedIn was Nigerian expert. But because I called myself a Nigerian expert, the only requests and inquiries I was receiving was from Nigerians or from those overseas looking for Nigerian opportunities. I woke up one morning and I told myself, come on, Aka, Nigeria is good, but Nigeria is 200 million people. But Africa is better. Africa is over a billion people, 55 countries. And so I changed my nomenclature on LinkedIn. Go and check it now to Africa Expert. In a space of one month, I had inquiries from Botswana, Namibia, from the Gambia, from Francophone countries. And so my opportunities increased just by my repositioning. Are you a Nigerian professional or an international professional? What is your calling card? When you restrict your space, you restrict your place. My place is big. Is the reason why I cannot be broke. Because even though I live in the UK, 55 countries are looking for me. Who is looking for you? What problems are you solving? Who are you? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Odon. Thank you so much. Wow, big, big one. Who am I? That is one of the things that I teach my students every time. This is, this is the very first thing. It's the, it's, it's the question you ask for anything you're going to do. If you're going to get married, who am I? Who is the other person? Who are we in whatever we're doing? And so that's, I, I always tell students, that's the very first question you ask before you start making any career decisions. So I'm going to, um, Dr. Odon made, um, he said something about if he, was, if he forced his child or if he told his child to go and do medicine, then we should arrest him. So I'm going to, I, I have a poll here. I have a poll here, which I'm going to send out now. I've launched it now. Did your parents force you to choose a career? That's for everyone except your co-host. So I'm getting responses. I'm getting responses. Lovely. Okay. A few more people. A few more people are responding. So I'm going to end the poll. Only about 19 people have responded, 19 of 32. Well, are we seeing the results? So about 19 people responded, 79 or no, 20 people responded. And 15% um, said no, and 5% said yes. So I'm going to do another one. So especially if, if your parents actually forced you to choose a career, then how did this affect your relationship with your parents? Oh, nice. Mm.
Okay. So I'll end that poll now because it was only about five people that said they were forced. And the results shows for some people, it's affected their relationship with their parents negatively, about two, um, 29% and 71% says it's, it's affected them positively. Well, that's five, five people said it's affected their relationship positively and two people said it's affected their relationship negatively. Okay. I have... Now, would you force your children or would you force your child to choose a specific career path? <clears throat> nice. 23 people who voted, 100% said they wouldn't. Oh, sorry. So can we see the results now? Most people are saying they wouldn't force their children. So like Dr. Odon, we wouldn't be forcing our children into any specific career. And the last poll before I introduce my next speaker. Oops, no, 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 that was the last poll. And so that sets the stage for my next speaker. <clears throat> Mrs. E Mrs. Loretta Iasele. So Mrs. Loretta Iasele is a teen parent therapist coach, an accounting graduate with specialty in auditing, team lead, home teaching tutor limited, and a social reformer. She holds certificates in professional counseling and substance prevention partitioning. She is the founder of Home Teaching Tutor Limited, a private educational outfit where children five to 19 years are tutored on board games and academic subjects in their homes. As a professional therapist and substance prevention practitioner with specialty in teenage counseling and coaching, she visits schools to address young children and also runs online programs, holiday training for parents and young children. Loretta is the convener of the Top Notch Parents Network on Facebook a fast growing platform with active members who are going through a learning process for great parenting in this century. The aim of the group is to bring parents closer to their children or wards, spread knowledge to every difficult question parenthood really provides and make parenthood a beautiful journey. She's married with two shining stars as she often calls her boys. She's blessed with a great family and seeks for the expansion of a beautiful parenting journey across Nigeria. Join me as we welcome Mrs. Loretta Eyasele. Good morning, Ma. You need to unmute. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Okay, okay, good. Good, good morning, day. Ma. Good day to everybody here, good day mm. for me. Um, good morning, Ma. <laughs> thank you for having me. I see it as a privilege to be part of this made in edition of the conference. Thank you, Thank you, know, you so uh, much. <laughs> uh, like you've uh, actually introduced me, I'm a coach and a therapist. Thank I you work very with much. teenagers and all of that. Can I continue? Yes, yeah, I... so I'll just give you an opening, my opening question. Right. So <clears throat> there was, a, there was a, a school I went to where I went to host the talk with the professionals. And I had a baker as one of the professionals. And so after she finished speaking, one of the a male, one of the children, a boy, he said, <clears throat> wanted to do food and nutrition, but his mom. My internet, my network is having a problem. But can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, you can hear okay. you. Okay, thank. Thank you. <clears throat> so he he said so. Um, he said his mom said boys do a Greek and not 
I'm not um, food and nutrition. No, you know, and I thought, wow. Boys are the ones who food. <laughs> okay, and and when I when I go to when I go to schools generally, and I, I just take a short survey with amongst the students. And you find that some parents still are still forcing children to say they should take a particular uh, course. Um, even with schools, counselors, I've spoken with a few, I've been able to speak with some counselors and school representatives, and they would say they're having problems with their parents, especially when it comes to the transition from GS3 to SS1. And they're saying, I want my child to go into the sciences. My child is going to be a doctor, you know? And I'm like, how can, I've seen, I'm 42. In my generation, we had, I had lots, some of my friends who were not on speaking terms with their parents for this very reason, because their parents are forcing them, forcing them to do something. And I'm like, I have children now. There's no way, I, I, don't, I can't imagine that at some point my children won't talk to me. I can't imagine what kind of relationship I would have that would, uh, what, what I would do that would break, bring that break in relationship between me and my children. And so the question now is, what, how, can, how can parents guide their children so that we're not creating that toxicity in the relationship between our parents and our children? Thank you for me. Um, I want to start with the word mentorship now. All right, you know, we, we, you know, when you, 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 as a parent, you are the first mentor. You are the first experience your child will see. All right, we all know mentorship is, is, a, is the most experienced or most knowledgeable person. You know, a mentor is knowledgeable and is the most experienced. So that's a, that's the place of the parent, the, uh, you know, in the present parent-child relationship. So you are the mentor to the child. You are to guide, to direct, and to lead the child, but not to force the child. When the child becomes of age, when it gets to a particular age, you should be able to release your child, you know? You should be able to release your child, guide your child towards doing, towards the path that the child wants to take. I give this example. For example, if you see a child always scribbling, and you are not the child who is always scribbling on, you know, on sheets of on sheets of paper. You are not the child. No, 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 no. You have to take the, the cutlass. You have to take the hoe. You have to take the shovel. It won't work. You have a right to be that child and not a farmer. Okay. If you see a child scribbling and all of that, you should be able to, like, you know, oh, I think this child is working towards the path of becoming a writer. Or, or becoming a part of somebody that will work with a pen and not the cutlass. But the challenge we're having these days is that, you see, parents, they want to like, they, they, they see most parents these days, they, they see themselves as always right. You know, there's a place for being always right. All right, that's when the child is still young and you are molding the child and you're monitoring the child, you're observing the child. When you eventually discover that this child is turning towards this particular skill or profession, please, you will not always be right. That's where toxic, toxicity come in, you know? And when a parent is easily angered also, you know, a child is turning towards this part, you are trying to like direct the child towards the angle where the child will not function well. You know, you are not aligned, you are not releasing the child. Well, you're easily irritated, you know, by the skill, by the skill your child is exhibited, you don't want it. I see some parents, they have a very big hospital. Um, they, they're like, oh no, my child must be a doctor by the time I pass on, who will take over? It doesn't work that way. I've also seen uh, 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 recently a, a parent, a female, so to be precise, who the parents forced into becoming um, a, a, a pharmacist. When she went to, she read pharmacy, but eventually when she got married, okay, she ended up becoming the writer she wanted to be, the author of books, and she's doing ex excellently well. So that's where the toxic, the, the, the toxic stuff come in now, you know? If you don't let your child be who the child wants to be, the child will not grow up healthy. I'm not talking of eating uh, good food and all of that. 
Healthy is as in a, you understand that really, there will be no healthy relationship between the, the, the parents and the child. All right? So please, I want to beg parents, guide your child and direct your child towards the path the child is taking, towards the path the child is telling. When you always speak on the, you always speak on the, the, the weakness of the child, the struggles of the child, you are not guiding the child rightly. All right, towards the, 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 the career path that the child wants to take. You see a child always singing and all of that. Always, you know, he likes to sing. And you're not telling the child to come and become a medical doctor. It won't work. It won't work. I fell victim of it. I, I read accounting like she read in my profile. I, I, struggled to, I struggled to an extent because my dad wanted me to be an accountant. I struggled until I, became, I, I got married and I, I had to go back to my dream. And today I'm happier for it. So if you, you, you want to have an awesome child, you want an awesome, you are trying to build a child who will become a perfect adult in future, who will give the best to your society, please, you have to release that child to be who the child wants to become. I don't know if I've actually answered your question for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Yasele. You have answered my question. So giving the child the opportunity to, to discover themselves while you're, I mean, you're growing with the child, you're watching the child mm. and you can see the direction that they're going to. So don't try to, I, I think some parents try to live their dreams through their children. You know, yeah. there's sometimes that, uh, maybe the, uh, a parent wanted to be a doctor. My dad would have loved if one of his children would become a doctor because he wanted to be one. But um, I think it, it didn't work out the way he planned. So he would have loved for one of his children to be a doctor. But luckily for, for us, he didn't, he didn't um, force any of us, but he kept on saying it, you know. So sometimes I think it's also sometimes, you know, there, I think there are different reasons Maybe, maybe as we go along the way, as we speak with other people, there are different reasons why parents would want to um, force a particular career on a child. So um, I, want, I would like to bring in my second speaker. Uh, but before we go in there, I have another poll, which I'm going to share. And because this is talking to teachers now. So, did you ever understand why you learned the quadratic equation? And so the poll has started. <laughs> the quadratic equation. <clears throat> So I have no. I'll just go on. No, just take the poll. Um, another three seconds and I'll end it. And so I'll share the results. So out of 17 people who voted, 94% said they don't understand why they learned the quadratic equation. And one person said they did. That's interesting. Okay, so most of us learn, this is actually for math teachers, but, uh, I mean, math teachers will understand what I'm saying. And most of us who have done math before, we all did the quadratic equation and we don't, we don't really know why we learned it. I remember um, when doing a, I, I went to lesson in secondary school and then the, I mean, with hindsight, I guess he, he wasn't a professional teacher. It was just some university university students doing extra extra moral lessons for us. And he, and then they're teaching us maths, and they're like, you know, after all this, you're never going to need it. And I was like, my God, why? So why did they why did they why are they, why why are they bothering me with all this if we're never going to need it? And so with that, with that, I'm going to introduce my next speaker, Mrs. Oluremi Tanimola.
Yes. And so Mrs. Tanimola is the principal, is the principal of Ransom Kuti Memorial Senior Grammar School, Mushi, an educator with over 29 years of teaching experience. She has served as a class teacher, subject teacher, assistant year tutor, and head of department department. She holds a BSc in Food Science and Tech, UNIFE, PGDE. Usman Danfodio University, Sokoto, an M.Ed. in Measurement and Evaluation, Unilag, a certificate in early childhood education. She has passion for learning, creativity, leadership, teamwork, mentoring, helping, and seeing students achieve their goals in life. She is currently serving in the Family Friendly Children's Ministry of the Citadel Global Community Church. She is a member of the Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria, and the Nigerian Institute of Training and Development. Join me as we welcome Mrs. Oluremi Sanimola. Good morning, Ma. Welcome. Good morning, Ma. Good morning. Thank you. Good Thank morning, you. everyone. Yes, Ma. Thank you. And so, my opening to question to you. A program. Thank you. Yes, Ma. So my opening question to you this morning, as I was saying, the quadratic equation, nobody understands it. A lot of things that we learned in the classroom, we never really saw the, the, the importance of what we were learning it for, for. And so I find, I, I think it's, it's quite difficult for children when they don't see the point, they, have their, they don't have the motivation to learn. So the question now is, what can teachers do? How can, they, how can they teach in such a way that the child sees that bridge between the classroom and the world of work and the outside world? So that it's not just what they're writing on the board, the notes that we're writing and all that, but that they see that this thing is actually useful for what they're going to do afterwards. Over to you, Ma. Mrs. Tanimola, are you there? Thank you for me. Yes, well, ma'am. like you really said, we all learn so many things without necessarily knowing <clears throat> what that thing is or the purpose of that thing. From my experience as a teacher, I don't realize that the, the primary thing that one needs as a teacher is to know your role. Your role as helping, guiding learner to the destination point. So I now see that there is a measure of influence that every teacher must have on the learners. And if we're going to actually help, to make learning real for them because learning, learning it's when learning is real that the connection between what is learning in the classroom and the outside world. So when you make learning, for you to make learning real, then you must identify each learner as an individual, not lumping them together. That's a big one. Another major problem that I've seen from my experience is focusing on theory. When all you just teach from the textbook, give, it, give note to, to the learners, there is no way they can relate. You get the example of math. It's not really, really, really limited to math. Every single subject has connectivity with the outside world. And also, as a teacher, we are not just connecting with the learner within the classroom. No, your influence must go beyond the classroom in the sense that you want to kind of affect them. You want to have a lifelong impact on that individual. And if they're going to have a lifelong impact, you want to teach in a way that that child is seeing his future not just the notes. 
Apart from that, in the process of being passionate about what you are doing, you are able to, you know, to go beyond yourself, wishing and desiring to bring in everything that will make it possible for that learner to connect better. And that is where the, pro, pro, I mean, the, the, the place of projects, practicals come in. You cannot make learning real unless you use materials outside your notes, outside the blood, the whiteboard today that we are using. Apart from that, every child has his own peculiar nature. And that's why we see that they don't learn at the same rate. And in education, we're not just limited to paper and book. There are other aspects of education that are outside the curriculum, which we call the co-curricular. And when we, when we actually focus and give attention to that aspect of education, it helps to discover those children. It helps to help us help them discover themselves. That's the major thing. Because there's no way that you can, any, any child can connect learning with work life without discovering his or skills. And you're not waiting until that child is out of school. It's an everyday thing. The more you expose the learner to variables all around the environment, the more that learner is able to pick and able to discover himself. Then having discovered himself and herself, the place of a teacher comes in. That is encouragement. There are so many factors that may not allow such learning to take place. We are all aware of that. And that's why a teacher must be emotionally intelligent. You, you are teaching, you are not showing empathy. You are not even, look at the, the situation we just came out of, the COVID experience. It's even on, it's still on. And a lot of our learners have been emotionally, emotionally pulled down. Now, we, we started learning for, for us in, in public schools. We have to, to, just like any other school, globally, private schools in Nigeria, we have to embark on teaching them virtually. But as of today, most of our learners are not able to connect for obvious reasons. Some of them don't even have the devices. And that's another thing that comes in the place of parents, like the first speaker, and of course the, the keynote speaker said, the encouragement from parents, another thing. Sometimes teachers, there's a lot of difficulties. We don't have collaboration with, with our parents. Now, you, you want to teach a, teach a student practicality of things. It's going to involve money. It's going to involve materials. Maybe it is that day that that child chooses not to come for no valid reasons. So there are so many things that I believe that we can do. But primarily as teachers, it is important that we isolate our learners. They have different learning requirements. And also, learning is not just about academics. It's not about the, it's not about the cognitive. Other aspects of learning, we must begin to focus on it. Psychomotor, affective, because that is where we can draw the skills and discover the skills of this learner. And when they are able to match, then we can now help them to enjoy what they are doing. Many of the students run away from school because school is boring. We are in 21st century. Some of us don't even use the skills of 21st century. Meanwhile, these children, when they go back home, they, they, they see the world is not a global village. They see what obtains in other parts of the world, even in their locality, what their peers, what opportunities they have. So a lot of factors, and these are just few of them. However, another thing that is key is that as teachers, we, we don't want to limit ourselves to scheme of work like we always say, topics to be taught. There is a place of teaching virtues in the, in the classroom. Because it, that is where a lot of these learners will discover themselves. Thank God many of them are brilliant. Beyond being brilliant, they don't know enough, anything. But when we bring in teaching virtues, that is aspect of character education, those are the things that will help them to thrive. 
in the workplace. Those are the kind of skills that we help them to, pre to, to get ready before they go outside the school environment. And some of those virtues, uprightness, goodness, even their behavior generally, their moral behavior. The, 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 the virtues that we help them to stand with their, with their peers without being, without feeling, without having any sense of low self-esteem. Those are part of the things that I think as teachers, we need to, to really inculcate. So, and of course we should make, we need to pay attention to their mental health. That is another area where we have, over the years we have missed it. A lot of those children are going through psychological and emotional body problems that do not allow them to think of, even when, when you are making it real, they are disconnected. So be, be, we need to, to extend our teaching beyond classroom, and that's why we must relate with them. We must develop relationship with our learners. And it's a lifelong one. Sometimes some of us say that, oh, I've taught this child in GSS one, and that's it. That child that you taught in GSS one, if you have really developed a form of relationship with that child, you want to build on it. So there's a measure of follow-up. That is why every teacher must see himself as a counselor, as a mentor, and as a role model. Now we are talking about career. The teacher himself must have understood what it means to, to aspire more in terms of career development. You're mute. Okay. Ah, since when was I muted? I didn't know. Just not too long ago. Just now, I think it's the network. So basically, a teacher too must have a good understanding of career aspiration, must see himself, his role as a mentor, as a counselor. So it's not just about forming your, your lesson notes, right? I mean, going to class to teach. No. There must be a relationship build up. And it's not a one off thing. You build mm. on it over the years. I was talking about you teaching a child in GSS 1. We are not teaching that child or that class again in GSS 2. You don't have to break down the wall of relationship between you and that child or those students. You want to continue to encourage them. You want to continue to link up with them, to follow them up. Most of the encouragement that these learners have, especially in public schools, they are actually from school. So when they mm -hmm. have us to look up to and we are able to guide them, it goes a long way. So from, you know, from relating with them on a close range, we are able to begin to guide them along their path of career. If you ask an average, even SS1 student, some in SS2, what they want to become, they don't know. Mm. But well, if you have been, imagine if you have got involved with them from GSS 1, it might be cumbersome. But with that interest, you want to go the extra mile. You see yourself as a solution provider. Yes, we, most of the time what we see is problem, problem, problem. There are problems. You talk about population of the students. You talk about the parents not cooperating, not collaborating. You talk about truancy. A lot of situations, but every problem that we identify actually have solutions. But if we don't see ourselves as solution providers, then they, we get stuck. Mm. So for me, okay. that relationship is very, very key. When you build relationship, then you want to pay more attention. You want to look at that child, everything about that child. You are interested in, in, in his mental health. You are interested in his mental development and his emotional development. How is he fearing? What makes him behave the way he behaves? Then you, 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 on a closer look, you begin to see some things that are peculiar to that child. They might be related to the skills that you now begin to help to develop. That child might not have seen it, but you have seen it. It could be from the handwriting. It could be from the way the child speaks. You know, yeah. you begin to ask questions and along you, know, you are able to guide that child. A child that from GSS was so interested in projects, 
in, a, in a research, in bringing items related to science, you begin to see that, oh no, there's something different about this yes. one. So for me, every child has a skill, every child has a future. And as teacher, it is our role to help mold that future, to build it up. However, if we are not passionate about what we are doing, it may be difficult to do that. It may be very difficult. And let's remind ourselves, this will cost us a lot, not just our time, beyond our time. It's going to cost us more than the government or the, the employer, let me say the employer now is paying us. It's going to cost us our own personal resources. But I tell you what, mm. there is no investment that you put on a child that is ever wasted, mm. none whatsoever. So it's very, very important that we note this as teachers. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you very, very much. It's, um, I, I, I've, I've asked children a lot of times if they want to become teachers, and most of them say no. And um, there, was, there was a time I was able to like, engage about two or three. And they said, I mean, they had given it a lot of thought, and they said, it's very stressful that do teachers actually have time for themselves? So... <laughs> So it's not, it's not I, I don't think it's the fact that they hate, they hate teachers or anything, but they feel that the work of a teacher is quite difficult. So thank you so much for your insights, Mrs. Tanimola. I can see there's some, there's some, um, there, there's some comments coming in. We'll read them as time goes by, but we're going to move to our next speaker. But before then, I have another poll to introduce our next speaker. So, have you ever taken a train ride to any destination in Nigeria? Has anybody taken a train ride? Oh, nice, in Nigeria. The reason I'm asking will be will be apparent when we get in there. So I'll end the poll in a few seconds. And I'll stop it right now. So I'll share my results. So has anyone taken a pole ride and I mean a train ride to any destination in Nigeria of, we have um, 11 answered yes, that's 48% and 14 said no, 61%. So my next question, have you taken a boat ride from Ikorodu to Lagos Island? Has anybody taken a boat ride from Ikorodu to Lagos Island? Whoa, I haven't either. <laughs> okay, so I'll end polling. So of 27 people who voted, 25 have not taken that ride and two have taken the ride. Interesting, I haven't taken the ride either. But it's on this premise, I'm going to um, introduce my next speaker. My next speaker is Mrs. Shade Olawoyi. She is the managing director, CEO of Shade's Fashion, Shade's Fashion House Limited. She is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, where she won both the first prize and best qualifying lady awards and final level in year 2000. She has an MBA specialized in Sorry. She has an MBA specialized in general management and a HND accountancy and a certificate in dressmaking and fashion designing. She has a certificate from Women Entrepreneurship and Leadership for Africa, a program by China Europe International Business School. Her corporate career started in 1994 as an audit officer 
She works in various industries, including banking, service and upstream oil and gas, where she rose to be a financial con controller. She resigned in 2015, having worked 21 years, including 12 years in senior management cadre to become a full-time entrepreneur. Her undying love for fashion and garment business led her in 2012 to establish Shades Fashion House Limited, a garment making company producing high quality uniforms and premium stylish ready to wear apparels using local and Western fabrics. SFHL renders services to both corporate and private clients. Shade is very skillful in pattern drafting and designing is an excellent manager and responsible for managing the overall operations of Shadows Fashion House Limited. She's an astute learner, always keen about personal development and a public speaker. She's happily married to Gwenga, an executive chartered insurance professional and consultant and capture of the African markets for African bodies and organizations to grow and establish themselves in the international market. So join me as we welcome Mrs. Shade Olawoyi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ma. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining. So one of the one of the reasons why I called, uh, I, I I asked to join as an uh, an accountant, uh, an econ an economist, was that. I feel that one of the reasons why parents force their children is uh, force specific careers on their children is that they're looking for safe careers. And when I say safe careers, things like medicine, like the top, the top, the four top careers I usually see when I take uh, like a survey among my students is accounting, law, medicine, and engineering. And those, and, and when, when you ask what parents are forcing their children into as well, it's usually along those lines, medicine, law, you know, but there are other things going on. So for example, the, the government is investing heavily in transportation. That's why I asked about the train rides, who has taken a train ride, because that is a, an area that is opening up. And so, um, uh, and then, and also, why I guess teachers also are not bringing that that um, that bridge, bridging that gap between the classroom and the world of work, is there also a bit of a disconnect with what is going on in the economy? That's my thinking. It might be wrong, but it's just my thinking. So that's why I I actually called on you to like give us some comfort. What is going on in the economy that? our parents and teachers can start looking at to say, okay, the government is doing this, the government is doing that. In the next three to five years or seven years, by the time the children are coming out, these are some, these are careers, career paths that are opening up. So can you, can you give us so, some, some information on that? Okay, um, thank you. I would I will start off um, by some cardinal points. And the first is that parents should realize that your survivor does not come from anybody. Number two, not just the government, even individuals are taking initiatives. And these people, these individuals are not better than you are. The world is already moving. And people without the knowledge of trends will be left behind soon. The leading jobs are not jobs just being created by government alone, but also by the private people. And with that foundation, you know, I'm happy with your question because it ties into um, what I just said, one of the points, which is knowledge of the trends. The year 2020 has marked the end of a system and has fast forwarded another system. The system of automation has been fast forwarded. And so parents should begin to look at what are the things that are happening today? How can those things be automated so that they are better off? In five years time, in 10 years time, what's gonna happen 
to even these professions, the law, accountancy, medicine, and engineering, what's going to happen? In several discourse I've been in, I've, you know, it's quite um, sad that most times there's a disconnect. Disconnect between classroom, the courses, the subjects being rendered, and the real life. You asked a question in the poll, which I will just go back to. And the question is, did you understand why you learned the quadratic equations? When you asked this, that question in the poll, I, I laughed and I said, ooh, this is fantastic. Personally, I have come to understand why. For me, in those quadratic equations, you're always looking for what is y, what is x. But the application that I found out is your ability to look at things that appear complex and see how you can simplify them into small pieces. And eventually, those small pieces will be adding blocks for the total or the big structure that you want to have in place. You give another poll, which is the transportation, water, and the train. That's what the government is doing. And so many times we, um, you know, parents need to come off this high profile job, so to say, the high, the so-called high profile jobs. Every job can pay. As simple as water, selling pure water, it does pay because it's a necessity. Everyone would need water water to drink, to cook, to bath, to do so many things. And so there should be first and foremost a disabuse that a job is little or a job is glorified. Trending nowadays, you know, jobs that would, would, would tend to um, dominate the future in Nigeria, in my, in my view, number one is digital marketing, business analysts, clean energy jobs, software development. If you, if you notice with those key ones I've mentioned, they're all turning to IT. And that's why I said that the 2020 COVID-19 afforded the automation. The automation that we thought would start probably in 2030 or 2035. Uh, it has brought it so many years forward. And so you should be looking at whatever costs when your child is displaying whatever interest it is, look at the background of that job and see how can it be automated? Yes, the child is scribbling and all of that. Writing, if you, if you wrap IT around it, you're asking yourself, how can it be automated? You still find that your child is always you know, tearing things. He wants to find out why, what is inside this, the, you know, what's, what is this and all of that. That shows the child is very inquisitive. You wrap around IT around it and see this traits by this child. What is displaying? How can IT make it better off? And so the questions, I'm so happy with, you know, what the main speaker said, talking about problems. We need to look at our lives and say the issues that are at hand today in five years time with IT around, what's going to happen and what's going to become of that? And that should help us and guide our child. A child that says food and nutrition, we should not just you know, wash up and say this. We should look at how, putting the IT factor. Because for me now on all things, you should always constantly ask, if you put technology into this, what difference would it make? How would it be done? It would amaze us today that there are a lot of Chinese in Nigeria who have bought expand land, and are into farming, but they're not into the regular farming. They're into the mechanized farm, farming. They have their equipments brought in and they're doing that. A lot of people will look down at our Greek because what they see is a hoe and a cutlass. But it's beyond that. And so in everything that is going on, the world is changing. Whatever skills that are being manifest now, put an IT spectrum into, into it and look at it from the lens of technology. What's going to change? What do you think will change in, in, in a couple of years? How do you think IT is going to you know, affect this? And that should guide us in leading our child. 
in whatever it is that they want to do. Everybody wants a quick way out of things. But we found out that the fastest way around doing things, look at the session that we are having now. But for COVID-19 last year, you probably would have planned a physical conference, bring everybody into a room and all of that. But times have changed. The conference is still holding, but on the lens of IT, we're having an e-conference. And so that's, those are the kind of things that we should look at and see how things will change. It takes a lot of thinking, a lot of, and not just, and that's why I started off with, that it's not the government, so your so survivor does not depend on anybody. You too need to look at it. The government has its role to play. You as an individual has your role to play. As a parent, as a teacher, you're looking at it. And even in the courses that are the subjects that are being taught and all of that, in the lens of IT, how will that change? Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Mrs. Olawe. Your survival does not depend on anybody. And people without knowledge of the trends will be left out. Truly, what you said about um, having our conference now, I've, I've, I've had this on my plate for a long time. And if not for COVID, we really wouldn't be online. I would have been looking for a big hall. I, I actually did find a hall early last year, but nothing could happen last year. But I'm so grateful for IT. Now I have people from Ilori, from Ogun State, from, from Borno State, from Bayelsa. Everyone joined in. Imagine if they had to come to a physical space, then some people would be stuck in traffic somewhere you know, and so many man hours gone. But here we are with the help of IT. And this is also one of the things that I tell children. I have a program that I call uh, My Community and I, and we talk about how the, the summary of that says my career is an expression of who I am in service to my community, where my community can be as small as my home and as big as the, as the whole world. And so somebody created Zoom and they don't know me. They just made it. But here I am. I've, I've been able to use it as a platform. And here we're all talking together. Somebody did something that is serving a good purpose. And so that's what our careers serve to do. But really, as you said, no job is too little. There's so many things. Um, recently... Um, in my in my home, we wanted to fix a new tank, and we, because we're saying we don't have enough water for all of the, for everyone in the compound, so we're going to put fix a new tank. And so the plumber came, he set the one that we had, he repositioned it, and then our new neighbors brought in a big a big tank, and then he looked at it and he said, "No, I don't think we should use this tank because it's too big." Without water, it's heavy already. I don't know the capacity of the roof that we want to put this tank on. And so if I put it on, it could break the roof, you know? And it just came to me, I'm like, this is why we learn capacity. This is why we learn weights and things like that, you know? And it's, he was a plumber. But when you ask him, he will say, not so many people are interested in plumbing. Now there's so many estates springing up around the country, they're going to need plumbers to fix the plumbing in those, in those places. If we don't have enough plumbers, what's going to happen? So as you said, no job is little, but everything we do is serving the community, is serving society. And that's the whole reason that, I mean, careers have developed out of service, trying to make, uh, we're making society easier for us to live in. And that's why we need to, and that, that's where these different prof professions have developed. And so, as you said, there are new problems springing up. Like um, Dr. Odon said, where there are problems, we see opportunities because that's an opportunity for something new. A new career, a new, yeah, a new career path is opening up. A new occupation is opening up where there's a new problem. And new, new occupations will keep on springing up while some will become obsolete. And so it's very good as, as parents, as teachers, we need to follow the trends, understand what is going on in the economy. 
and uh, and and position like when when we now see our children see what they're doing see how how they're developing then we we are able we are better able to direct them where they where they can go instead of saying my child has to be a doctor and because because I wasn't able to be a doctor you know it's there's so there's too, there's too much there's too much to do I'm I, I something that comes to mind is um there's the the photographer of um uh, the president, a young man, I think Omar Borio or something. And I'm just trying to think, what if his parents were saying, why are you, why are you interested in photography? Your mates are doing medicine and engineering. Why are you taking pictures? And now he's rubbing shoulders with the high and mighty. So if his parents have stopped him from, from, from exploring and, and, and building on that talent, imagine, I mean, where would he be now? So that, that's really the charge for, uh, our parents. So now we're going to go over to the next speaker while wow, time is really fast spent. We're going on to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Mrs. Olawi. Um, and I have another poll, the final poll. Nigeria no imported frozen chicken. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> so Nigeria no imported. Which one? <laughs> okay. I'm going to end the poll right now. And so of 25 who voted, 22 imported. go for Nigerian and 3% go for imported. Interesting. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to sing a song before I introduce my next speaker. <clears throat> and anybody who knows it, those who know it, they can sing along. But please don't put on your mics, just sing along where you are. Ishe agbe, nishe ilewa, eni koshishe, ama jale, iwe kiko, la isi okon, oko, a ti ada, ko ikwe o, ko ikwe o. So, my next speaker as I'm going to introduce now, is Dr. Ebinimi Ansa. Yes. Dr. Ebinimi Ansa is a research scientist and director at the African Regional Aquaculture Center a department of the Nigerian Institute for Oceanography and Marine Research with over 25 years experience in fisheries, biology and aquaculture management. In 2011, Dr. Anster won the highly contested postdoctoral fellowship of the African Women in Agriculture, Agricultural Research and Development, which was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the United States Aid for International Development. She is presently the vice president of award country chapter, Nigerian Women in Agricultural Research for Development, NIWOD. Dr. Ansa is also an active member of other professional associations, including World Aquaculture Society and Fisheries Society of Nigeria. Dr. Ansa seeks solutions to mitigate the problems attributed to climate change and pollution effects on aquatic life through culture of selected species of migratory prawns, sedentary mangrove, oyster, catfish, and tilapia, among others. Being a farmer and a certified trainer of the Nigerian Agricultural Enterprise Curriculum for Entrepreneurship Training of Farmers, she has been able to positively influence hundreds of farmers and fish processors across Nigeria through training and skills development of these farmers in partnership with local and multinational organizations. Dr. Ansa is God-fearing and draws strength in service to God and humanity. She is married to Joseph Ansa, and they are blessed with children. Join me as we welcome Dr. Ebinimi Ansa. Good morning, Ma. Good morning. Welcome. Here. Yes, Ma. Welcome. Uh, so one of the, one of the things that the last speaker said, Mrs. Olawoyi, she said people think about farming. They think of the hoe and the cutlass. And so they're, they're not really interested in going into farming. 
Meanwhile, I remember when um, Dr. Adishino was the Minister for Agriculture, he said, we need to move from farming to agriculture, right? And he said, so he was, he was really interested in the mechanized farming uh, as in the, so yes, something much more um, mechanized than what we're doing. And so when I asked about the Nigerian versus imported frozen chicken, my experience is that in 2019, myself and my husband started a poultry and when the borders got closed, we started the poultry and we were, we were, rare, we were rare broilers. And so then we'd process and then we sell it frozen. And so by the time the borders were closed, the market really opened for me. And most people that started um, patronizing me said they preferred what I was selling to, to what they were used to, you know? But is the supply even enough? Are we, are we able to feed ourselves enough, right? And, but what, what, I, what I really want you to discuss with us now, like, like uh, Mrs. Ola, when you said, people are not really looking in that area. But can we, what is the value chain in agriculture that we can start to look at now that parents and teachers can even start to direct their children to that area? The floor is yours, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Agriculture is a beautiful thing. It's something that encompasses so much, more than we can even think or imagine. I'm glad you have a stint in a poultry farming and you enter the business at the right time. Last year, there was so much challenge for where do I buy food, how do I get food, cost of things were just going up. But the farmers... We are so happy because for once, they didn't have competition of importation of, uh, for instance, frozen chicken. And um, I didn't do the poll because the panelists were out of it. But any day, yes. any time, I would prefer to have Nigerian chicken. My husband and I, we've been farming broilers for several years, I think from 1996. And just like you experienced, when people buy our broilers, they don't want to buy from somewhere else. And it also affected us. When we couldn't produce anymore because of certain challenges, we, we, we found it difficult eating chicken you know, that was imported. And I would prefer if I go to a shop, I say, look, where's this chicken from? Is it from Zatek? I look for the, the names that are known in Nigeria, okay, I want that actually. If it's imported, I, I can't buy it and all that. You know, because the imported ones, they have to go the extra mile to preserve them, to bring them in, and to make them available to the populace. So there are so many things involved in agriculture. You know, agri means land. Uh-oh. Hello, Ma. Um, she's culture to cultivate. Okay. So the fish, and even in each of those areas. Okay, saying my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear. But we missed we missed part of what you were saying. Agriculture. You said agriculture is land, and then it, yes, it's... agri agri means land, and the culture means to cultivate or to rear or to farm or to raise. And then you can do many things. You can go into crop production. You know, that's the basic area when you do production in the value chain. Then you can go into processing. There are some people who don't farm anything, but they get what the farmers have produced, process them, package them, and put them in the market on shelves or wherever they want to sell them or even sell from door to door. And now with the IT, you know, being so available, some people don't even have a shop. Their WhatsApp statuses, their Facebook stories <laughs> become their advertisement platforms. Mm. So a lot of things are changing in the sector. And a lot of young people are realizing that, look, 
we can make quick money, even if we don't have the mechanized things. Let's go to the, the, the hinterland, the villages, pick up stock from the, the, the farmers. For instance, yams. Pick up the yams. Test them. There are nice equipments built by um, built by um, Firo. Firo is a federal government establishment in Oshodi. They, mm. they do a lot of mechanized producing mechanized equipment for processing of food and other commodities. So you pick up these equipment and you process and make your yam flour, package wow. it and you sell it. So the value chain is broad. So you can do that for many other products. During the COVID lockdown, one of my mentees, she's actually a lecturer, but she has a flair for food processing, okay? So she had to now start, you know, when we heard of the Madagascar tea and all those things, she started gathering material, orange peels, neem, this dogonyaro leaf, um, other spices and herbs. And she would take them, process them. She had a solar tank, a simple solar tank, where she would dry the product and then process them and put them into tea bags as a trial. And she sold the idea to her institution. And the, the head of her institution was so impressed and even gave her a little grant to make it, you know, like on a commercial basis. And then she's also teaching her students how to do these things. She had an online training for about a week and she was teaching them and other people were also allowed to participate. So a lot of things are, you know, leaning towards agriculture. We can't run away from it. People need food and people need good food every day. They need to be able to afford it. And if we don't make enough, the prices will keep skyrocketing. And I think that is where the world has seen Nigeria as a place where they can bring all kinds of food stuff because we are about 200 million people that need to be fed with good food daily. So if we look inwards, we have all it takes, excuse me. We have the agricultural research institution. We have the NGOs like NIWOD, Nigerian Women Agricultural Research for Development that provides technical support, mentorship for young people, especially the, the, the secondary school students. We do career talks for them. Those who are interested in agriculture, it's not all about the hoe and the cutlass. There are ways of doing it, but they must be interested. We can't force them, but we show them the skills and we show them the, the value chain. It's very broad. Some may even want to go into marketing of agri products. Some may want to go into academia to, to do research on how the farmers can do these things better. So they relate to the farmers, see their problems, and then come back to the laboratory and find solution. When the solution is found, they package it maybe in the form of a manual, or organize a seminar and say, wow, I've got this information for you guys. You can come out of this problem without any stress. So the research angle cannot be overlooked. We need a lot of people who will go into agricultural research. That is, there's a very huge gap in that area. And then in the extension of this research, in transferring this technology and innovations back to the farmers, we also need people in that area. We need people who will also educate our young people. Now in YEG, they've introduced more agri-related courses like fisheries and aquaculture. How many teachers in the secondary schools can teach fisheries? There's a secondary school just next door to my office. And one of the principals said, Madam, see, we have agri science teachers, but we lack fisheries teachers. Can you partner with us to provide such service? And gladly we accept it so they can come for their practical sessions. We can give them small talks, show them practically how to, to raise fish. It's an integrated farm, so we can also show them other things, seeds, poultry, you know. So they gain all the knowledge in one place. 
And at the end of the day, they'll be better off. So when they have their exams and they need to do the practical, they already have that awareness created. So they will find it difficult differentiating a baby fish, which is called the fingerling, from you know, maybe the juvenile or the adult. So all these basic things help. Maybe I should just go back a bit. When Dr. Akanimo was speaking, he said he read zoology. Coincidentally, I'm a zoologist and I'm very happy I am here. As a young girl in primary school, when we had the nature science practicals, I was never satisfied with what the teacher gave me in class. I would come home to see how I can set up my own, you know, let me call it a laboratory. And guess what? My parents were never tired of what has she brought in again. So there was a day I got um, a caterpillar on a near, from a nearby uh, bush. I picked it, picked some of the leaves, put it in an old empty jam bottle, pierced the top so that air could, you know, get into it. And I said, I must see this caterpillar become a butterfly. So that was a passion right from childhood. And I'll always keep these things in my parents' bedroom because for me, that was the safest place. My siblings would not understand this madness. So, but they would just let me do my thing and they'll be watching from a distance. You know, so another thing I was interested in, I'm bringing these things up so that when you see children doing well, what we think is queer, just let them be the monitor to see how they are progressing. We had a little aquarium and I was like, okay, I, I think I like this. So when there's a fish in there, I will take time to feed it. I will take time to make sure it's okay. It has good water and all that. And once my dad got some uh, what we call post larvae of the shrimp, freshwater prawn. That's where my interest for prawn came, you know. And he got so much, and we gladly put it myself and his cousin, who was also interested, put them in the aquarium. We didn't want them to die. But the following morning, what happened? They were all dead. And my cousin said, ah, let's just pack it and eat. And I was like, pack it and eat? I said, you know, ah, how can we pack? You know, I was feeling so bad that we couldn't provide the right environment for the survivor of the plants. You know, so that is part of the research I'm doing even now to see how this larvae can survive in an environment different from this. So the value chain is very broad. We can even talk about the business. Yes, Dr. Kim said agriculture is no more agriculture. It is now a business. A lot of people are doing agribusiness. And agribusiness is something that you can easily make money. Even as a civil servant, as a teacher, you have a small space behind your house. You can use saps, put soil in it, and plant the simple vegetables like fluted pumpkin, ugu, as it's called, uh, waterly, gure in Yoruba, efiri or chow. You have these things behind your house. You'll be surprised how much money you will save in a year if you can have a small, you know, a backyard business of farming crops and any other thing. So you start small and you grow. So all these areas are very important. One of the panelists had also mentioned that there is no job that is superior. Let me put it that way, paraphrasing to the other, because every skill, every job is important, and everybody has something. To offer. So let us focus on seeing those innate abilities that the children have and guide them through to arrive at the destination. So as a mentor, what you have to do is to lend a listening ear. Both parents and teachers, you lend a listening ear to the child and you help them by pushing them in the right direction 
for that career prospect that they need. Because, you know, if you push them in the wrong direction, they may not be happy in life. It has been said here by other families. It, it, it's going to bring unhealthy, you know, growth, unhealthy relationships. And they, it may take them years before they actually find where they are supposed to be. So I would like to uh, pause here a bit. I don't know if I still have more time, but I would like <laughs> to pause here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ansa. So, well, fi time is fast spent. We're already at 11.52. But I think there's some comments. So I'll ask uh, Mrs. Sholanke to read some of the comments and questions, if there are any. And if, if there's anyone who, um, if there's a question, then any of our panelists will be able to um, respond. Mrs. Thank you. Shulanke. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone. And uh, let's keep ourselves muted. So like I was saying, I appreciate everyone for participating. Please, if you have any questions, you can still send them in. But for now, we have two questions. So the, the, the first question says, when we discover the talent in our children, what ways can we help them to materialize these dreams? Please, I would like us to, I would like these questions to be directed to all our panelists so you can weave the answer to the closing remarks that you will give at the end of this program. So every one of, every one of the panelists, the question says, when we discover the talents in our children, what way can we help them to materialize this dream? Then the quest, second question was directed to Dr. Ebinimi Ansa, which says, can you please give us the FIRO program for this year? So somebody is interested in having the programs that, that, that is being run by Federal Institute of um, Industrial, Industrial Research in OSOD. So I think that's, that question is directed to Dr. Ebinimi Ansa. So can you quickly provide maybe insight to that? Okay, I don't work at zero, but we have um, the... The, the website for Firo, so which I'll just drop www.fiiro.gov.ng. So you can check the website and see the contacts there and find out from them you know, what their programs will be like. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. And I also have a comment that came in just now. Many of the comments before now have been basically um, writing maybe things that resonate in the minds of listeners as they were listening. But I have a comment that came in. I said, but I suggest schools need to do more in terms of practical and reduce, sorry, and reduce theory. I think that is based, that is, that question is coming up because of um, the agricultural value chains that we have been exposed to. So the person is suggesting that schools need to do more of practicals and not just focus on the theoretical aspect. So this, this is thrown at all of us. At, we are both parents and we are both, um, we, are, we are parents and um, the first mentor that all these are children and our wards come to no. So he said we should do more of practical. And like Dr. Ebilimi said, all of us can have little, little spaces around us that we have little spaces around us. We can start the planning so that these children can really be exposed to the practical aspect of agriculture. So please, do we still have, okay, I think another question came in now. The question says, sorry, Okay, said sometimes the parents are not knowledgeable enough to guide the children. How do you help, how do you help parents in this regard? If the parents are not knowledgeable enough to guide the children, how can 
these parents, how can these parents be helped? Please, any of the panelists can answer this question briefly before we, before we wrap up the program. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. We are ready. Okay. We'll see you in the Mama. Mama. Yeah. I'll quickly just respond to that. This is Remita Nimola. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I just joined that one to the other one that has to do with discovery of talent. You know, one of the things I was jotting here is that as teachers is our role to educate the parents as well. For every child that you teach, you are not just teaching that child, you are teaching generations. You are teaching everyone connected with where learning must take place each time that you interact with children. Another way is that you know, talking about discovering their talent, how you can help them to achieve them. That is why it is important that we involve the children in the learning process. Give them tasks. You know, inculcate skills, collaborative skills, and other, other, other values in them. In addition to them, to that, career counseling is very key. And that comes in the area of choice of subjects. Our parents, many parents are not enlightened. Um, I, I, I must tell us now that even sometimes some teachers are not in life, and that's why a teacher must not work in isolation. Thank God we have counselors in school. Even counselors see don't, don't, don't work in isolation because we need to update with the current events. Things are changing fast. What obtained the subject combination I, I, I needed for my own course may not be needed now. So, teachers, we must update ourselves in terms of knowledge, then we must collaborate. Then we must guide these students in that they didn't have anybody to guide in secondary school. As a science student, I did not do physics. It was when I, I was about to write down, but I realized that the course that I wanted to do primarily required physics. So even at the time I, I, I was going to study food science and technology, that was not the primary. Eventually, I, I, I enjoyed studying the course. I was passionate about it. And, and the like, but it's important. And that's why it is important that we pay attention to them as teachers. When we pay attention, then we work with the parents, especially when we know the parents and, and the issue of practical too is very key, like I said. You see, the reason why some of these subjects are boring to some of our learners because they are not, they are not going to the area of practical, but I must tell you there is no single subject or no single topic that is not activity based in education. There's none. The only problem is that we often shy away from it. But you know, imagine when you teach, well, you might say, oh, time and everything. And that's why you own your time. I said something earlier on, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your time. So basically, the time that you have for that period may not be sufficient. But you want to extend this learning, you want this learning to really take place. The place of assignment is there. The place, place of project is there. The place of having the children ideas. They're not doing it alone. So along the line, through the part of self-discovery, you are able to now guide these children, talent. You are able to, to guide them that, okay, whatever you are becoming is related to your talent. If it's related to talent, then the problem is more that is. So it's a continuous journey, it's a continuous learning procedure. Yeah. Thank you, ma. Thank you. Thank then you, this question is also directed to you because we want you to attend to it as fast as possible. I said many of the teachers we have now, nowadays, they are teachers because they found themselves there. Maybe they want of jobs and chances yeah. just to them there. It is not really because they are passionate. So how can how do these teachers get help? Please briefly, ma. In a minute, mm -hmm. ma, can you help us provide Exactly. Yes, quickly. For us in Lagos State Government, you is being addressed on a continuous basis. And that is why training has been a continuous thing. Training, mentoring, selling. Now we have mentor mentee relationship even among teachers. You didn't plan it. You want to remain on the job. Then you must buy into the non job to make impact. Fine, you want to get out of the job. There is no, 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 no problem about that. But then there must be a, a desire to learn, to continue to learn, to relearn, to unlearn. So it's a continuous process. 
Thank you. Um, I, Sorry, no, can I say I, I something to that? Labor, Lagos State School. Yes, can I say something to yeah. the, the part of the teachers? You know, sometimes you find your, yourself in some areas where yeah. you didn't really plan. Sometimes it's, I mean, it's a season in life. If you take that part, that part that where you are the, at, the, at that moment in time, you learn, there's so many skills that you can learn in that area. Now for your own career development, look at what skills you're learning as a teacher. Because if you're going to get out, you're not just going to step out now. You need to plan ahead and say, okay, while I'm a teacher, what are the skills I'm learning here, which I can apply somewhere else? Do you understand? So it's not because the, a lot of us find ourselves in places where we don't really want to be, but they're skills that you learn and nothing, nothing is, um, nothing is ever, ever wasted. No knowledge is ever wasted. I found some people that didn't want to become teachers and they started teaching and found that they loved it. And then there's some that don't really want to be there and they want to get out. If you're going to get out where you are, what are you learning? What can you use? How can you apply those skills to something else? What can you apply it to? So those, the, you, you, need to, you need to make that gradual step. There are seasons in life and you're going, if, you're, if at that season you're in a place where you don't want to be, what are you preparing for your next step if you're going to step out of that, that position? Thank you. So just, we have also seen some other comments and I think most of the comments boils down to the fact that um, many of these children need guidance. They need, like somebody suggesting that um, the school needs to have a functional guidance and counseling unit so that they can even help students in subject combination. But I think this is one of the programs that is being run by the Save a Nation Foundation. And I also like to say, I've also seen there that new world can come in because orientation should start from the second, from the primary school, nursery school, which is key. So I like to say that this program is not just a one-off um, program. It will be something that will be, that will be coming up more subsequently. So we can always log in so that many of the parents, many of the teachers can really can really get because as mentors, you can't give what you don't have. It is what you have that will determine what you can give others. Then somebody also mentioned Wazobia TV and things like that. We thank you for all those observations and all those um, comments. They will be put into consideration. And like I've told you, this program is not a one-off event. It will be coming up subsequently. And we can always employ us to bring in our neighbors, bring in our friends, our siblings, every, everybody, so that people can be properly guided to know how they can guide their children. So. Briefly, we are going to allow the speakers to just give give their, their like their closing remarks. But I would like to summarize this program by saying that you know a verse of the scripture says, "Train up a child in the way he should go." So that means that, and I like a, a, one of our panelists that said that there is no job that is under no job that is a, that is a Honda. Yeah, when you wrap IT, when you automate many of those things, you discover that you will get the best out of it. And I saw from the comments as well, that somebody is saying that many universities don't give the children their choice of, um, of um, career. But I would like to say that the first degree, most of the degree we have is to open up our mind. That's why you see somebody that studied engineering that is doing well in the banking sector. So the degree basically is to, is to open up our minds to make us to be flexible. But when we now get into the, into the, when we get into the career, even so from the study, you begin to realize those things. You know, the first was saying that you should, we should do things that we are happy doing. Do things that even if you are not paid, you are still happy doing it. When you render short services, it will now bring value to you. So even in your course of study, if you are not giving what you want, there is still an opportunity for you to still go back, go back to your dream. The first speaker said he studied environmental management and things like that. But what is it doing today? It's basically teaching people, teaching teachers and parents how to guide their children are right. So that means that that degree is to open us up. But when we get into that study, we now begin to find what we want to do. And we should learn to train our children, 
not only the ones that came out from our womb, we have wards and, and students around. Let's train them. Let's, when we see abilities in them to actually be in a certain area, let's not try and change them to other things that we want. But let's try and farm those strengths in them so that they can be the best in whatever they try to do. So can we have the panelists just give their closing remarks? Time is far, far spent. Thank yes. you. So from Dr. Odon. Dr. Odon, are you still there? I think so. <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice to see you again. Thank you very much. So it's been a it's been an absolutely incredible conference. And thanks for inviting me. And this I think the speakers, all the speakers have been fantastic. So I, I guess um in response to the last question, what I think I think uh, the question was around once you've discovered the talent of the child, what do you do? So a way to put at it is it think about it more like and, and, and for, for some reason I like using the I like using the lion an analogy because it's very simple to understand. You cannot compare the roar of a of a cub to the to, to the roar of a lion. But the beauty is the more the lion roars, the better it gets. And so upon discovery, your fundamental once you understand the principle, is the more that child does it, the better they get at it. But I also have to put in a lot of warning, okay? There is something around, there's a difference between exploration and discovery. It is in the process of exploration that you discover. Mm -hmm. And so don't, don't fall under the, that, that, uh, that, uh, that challenge of determining the, the, the pathway of the child based on a single discovery. It has to be a continuous exploration. Maybe I'll use my, my, my daughter as an example. So like I told you, she loves music, okay? She loves to write, she loves to paint, she loves to sing, loves to play instruments. Now, fundamentally, they all fall within a particular subject matter area, which you would say maybe art and theater, something like that. But the point is, the more you expose her to these different things, and, that, and that's it's just the way it works. What happens is there is a, a strategic realignment and that would happen naturally. So right now, if you asked me or asked her of those five dimensions of, of uh, areas, which of them is our top priority? We don't do this now. Tell you right away, is, is art, is drawing. So drawing has superseded others over time. So but the trouble is you need to open that child up to different things. So for example, because of that awareness, I will, as a parent, I would do things like, I would wake up in the morning and give her my picture and say, sweetie, draw this for me, okay? And I will pay you. So draw it for me. She's just 12, by the way, just get my point. Say, can you, can you draw this picture and give me an invoice? What am I doing? I'm trying to mm. associate a commercial dimension to our gifting, okay? That's intentional. So for example, I would say, okay, well, she's got maybe a series of paintings. So she's done, so much more painting. Okay, I want to organize a very mini exhibition for her. Okay, what am I doing? I'm trying to get her into the point of understanding that there is a connection between her sustenance and her gifting. Then, so by doing so, or for example, or, or what is the next available documentary around art? Okay, who is doing what in art? Which celebrity is doing what in art? So keep her around that environment of her space because then, then she grows within that space. That's very fundamental. Um, I like one of, what uh, one of the speakers spoke about IT. I mean, you cannot, the world we live in, you almost cannot do anything without understanding the basis of the connection between what you do and the global space. And that's, that's, that's non-negotiable and it's, it's not going to stop. The, we, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. The, is, is, is the revolution around, uh, um, around cl cl cloud computing, around the internet of things. So that is going to continue. And the simple way I tell people is, whatever it is you do, just add tech to the end of it. So if you're an educationist, you're an education tech, account tech, just go on, farm tech. You see, that's the world we now live in. So but adding that, what you've done, you've, you've kind of aligned an IT dimension to what you do. Because therein lies your survival. Therein lies your career progression. Therein lies your differentiation. As a matter of fact, I mean, I mean, it's almost like me. And I, I, th I think just to wrap up now, no matter what you've done before, it's absolutely crucial to realize that for every step, there is a potential for transfer 
of what you lend to your next dimension. What do I mean? So a banker who worked in the bank for 10 years, but they love shoe design. And this is actually an actual story. What do you think the person, when he leaves banking and sets up a, a shoemaking company, there are a few things the person knows different from the average shoemaker. He, un, he understands the principles of finance. He will potentially make shoes that bankers would buy. So he wouldn't make 10, 10 naira shoes because he's left a space into their new spaces. I cannot have been, and I would have been a successful speaker and trainer if I don't have a principal background on research. That's why I work with trends. My PhD, even though in an area I do no longer work in, gave me a background that's been transferred to what I now do. So whatever I do, I understand research dimensions. I understand how to understand trends and statistics, data gathering to empower my training. So when I'm speaking, I'm speaking based on fact. But the point is, that's a transfer of skills from my PhD to what I now do. So nothing is ever lost. I think maybe, maybe a good way to end this is to say, everybody's special because by design, you have to be. Even the tortoise, as slow as the tortoise is, is design makes it survive. If we all believe in design, which I know, I'm, I'm sure we all do, every design pattern is created for survival and sustenance. And it's the function of the individual understanding who you are and what you are made of, and also what is available in the, in, in the global space and how can you align your gifting to fill in that space. Therein lies your distribution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Odon. Thank you. I really, really appreciate you coming on. We never met. As I said, I saw you on TV, on your view, and I knew that I had to engage with you. And I just sent a message, and here you are. So thank you so, so much for, for coming. Thank you very, very much. So uh, a last message from... Um, Mrs. Yasele, if you don't mind, can I ask Mrs. Mrs. Tani Mola to speak? Because she has had to leave a long time ago, but she has still stayed with us. So if we just ask her, uh, Mrs. No, it's Tani okay. Mola Let's to... have it. I'm not going for that program now. Oh, okay. Let's okay, have it. Okay. Yes. okay, okay. So Mrs. 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 Yasele, please give us your last words. I, mean, I wouldn't your last have, comments. I, I wouldn't have mind, but I'll still say thank you. <laughs> well, you. for me, not having a healthy relationship with your child, we only lead to the contrary. And what's the contrary? It's a toxic relationship. Managing a healthy relationship with your child from the onset, you know, we, we give room to a listening, cheerful, confident, smart, and an overall healthy, growing child. Okay. And I want us to look at paths to growth now for every child. Every parent should start looking, look out, start looking out for that skill in your child. And when you discover it, encourage, encourage the child. Don't put the child up, just encourage. Then provide opportunity, please. I want us to provide opportunity for the child to exhibit more. Let the child, let the child know you are happy with that skill or that gifting you know, that is he or she is bringing out, okay? Then you can help the child to nurture by identifying it, that by defining what that skill stands for, what that talent is, where it will take the child to. And for parents that really are not gifted in that area, I want to encourage us, look for the experts to nurture, to nurture, to build and grow on it, so that eventually, you, you, you groom and you bring up a, an adult that the society will be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You, ma. Thank you. So, Mrs. Tanimola. Thank you. I just leave a few words, especially with my colleagues out there. I want to remind us that teachers should learn to guide students to make career decisions, but not to mislead them. Then we should fuel learning by stimulating creative thoughts. We should inculcate in our learners leadership skills to help them imbibe the I can do it spirit. When they know that they, they, they can do, they are not limited. So, of course, and for those ones that are just struggling, we should learn to bring them up. We should learn to vary our methodologies <clears throat> in a way that every child learn no matter what, so that their future can be considered from time to time. 
And they, they too, they will begin to see that future that they have not got into. Very key. And of course, we should encourage our learners to volunteer. It's not yeah. common in this part of the world. But you know, when young ones are exposed to such one, volunteer to work in the community, community service, they begin to see their relevance. They begin to see themselves. And of course, when we each time we teach, we should learn to connect everything that we learn with the work life for them. We should, we should continue to emphasize how important that what they're learning here should, they should they're not waiting till they, they get to the university. They are applying everything now. So they must mm -hmm. see the connectivity. They must see how they can apply and we should allow them to think. Many a time we think for them. Many a time we are the one giving them choices. Let them come up with ideas. And through that, we begin to see that, oh, of the truth, there's so much in them. And when they come up with that, we, can, we only need to guide them in their career choice and everything. And um, we should not forget that we can't take that child in isolation. We must take the family along, especially their parents. And one word, word, word of God. It is James 3.1 that says, don't be, message version, don't be in a rush to become a teacher, my friends. Teaching is a highly responsible work. Teachers are held to the strictest standards. New King James says, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Tani Mola. Thank you for your words of encouragement and advice to our teachers. We'll have Mrs. Olawe. Mrs. Olawe, your last comments. Is she still around? <clears throat> Sorry, Mrs. Olawun, if you're there, your last um, comments for the day. I okay. don't think she's there. Okay, it looks like she's not. Yeah. Sorry, she's yeah, not. it looks like she's not here anymore. Not okay, here. so Doctor Doctor Ansa, Doctor Ansa, yes, yes, I'm back. Sorry, I. I had network issues. I Thank hope you can hear me clearly. Very well, ma'am. Okay. So what I want to leave with everyone is to assure us that every child has certain skills that they are born with. Yes. And it has patience enough. Patience is what the parents and the teacher required. So let's be patient with the children. Let's not shut them down when they're doing things that we don't really understand, but let us look at things from their own perspective so that we can guide them. And if you are running out of any means of assisting that child, there are institutions in place. Mm -hmm. You can even have a discussion if you are a teacher with the parents this is the challenge we are having with this child. Maybe they need special assistance. Maybe they need to also have extra um, support. There are institutions that are always there to help. I know save a child, save a child is <laughs> doing so much in that regard. So take them all along, see, and we also have a, a great nation. We don't have any other Nigeria. We are all here together. So let's okay. do our little best in our own ways. So there, there are a whole lot of uh, agricultural research institutions. I'm from the Nigerian Institute for Oceanography and Marine Research, and we do a lot in the area of fisheries, oceanography, aquaculture marine geology, geophysics, and it's a multidisciplinary institution, but we are more in the water than on land. So we have sister institutions full of Nigeria website. We'll be able to link up. So our teachers here, our parents here, you can link up and find what your child may need, learning tools, publications, manuals that will guide that child that really wants to go into agriculture as a career or as a business. 
So Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria, but Bob, but NG, AICN, but Bob, but NG, will give you the whole array of research institutions that have to do with agriculture. So please let's keep in touch. And then I also to happen to be the chairman of the union. So I, I, I have learned, you know, in this tenure to relate with the teachers, with the school management, and in some cases provide intervention when students have challenges and there's no agreement between the school management and the parents. So it's something we have to do as a service to humanity. Anywhere we are called on in society to serve, let's not back out. Let's take it as a responsibility because all these things we are doing will help build the career of our children and the future of our nation, Nigeria. We are sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mrs. Olawoyin, your last um, remarks. This, um, for the parents, for the child, the first thing is to act now. Yesterday's ended yesterday. So, start a mature conversation with the child about the future. Whatever traits the child begins to you know, um, exhibit, whatever skills the child begins to ex demonstrate, start a conversation and start asking leading questions. Oh, I can see that you like to tear paper. You like to... So is this how you're going to do it in five years' time, 10 years, when you're an adult, when you're a mommy, when you're a daddy? Are you going to continue to do that? Ask questions. Oh, why do you do this? I can see that you're always trying to find out why things are like this. Why do you do that? You know, ask leading questions about the future so that they can be what they do with a source of income, a source of revenue. So they're seeing it not just as activities, but they have Your network is a bit poor. We can't hear you very well. Generate active generating, sorry, generating income to at a triple. Thank you very much. Hello, do you, did you hear me? Yes, you're, um, Hello? yeah, you're fluctuating, but you, we can hear you now. Okay, so in summary, it starts a mature conversation about the future vis-a-vis -vis the activities the child is carrying out now, demonstrating now, and see, ask leading questions as to what that child will want to become. Ask the questions, oh, why? Why do you want to do this? How do you think it will sustain? How do you think, you know, IT in terms of, oh, you know, what do you think you can do better? And all of those. And not necessarily asking the questions around the four major, you know, the prominent um, professions or careers. But, you know, think out of the box and just keep asking leading questions. That way you're leading the child on. And in his or her quiet moment, is thinking and pondering, oh, okay, I play with this a lot. Maybe this, maybe that. And you two have answers to such things. One, two, three, four. Because you do this, would you want to do one, two, three, four? Which are related to the activities being demonstrated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank every, every member of the panel who came on today. Most of you, I don't know you personally but I reached out to you and you responded. I thank you so, so much. I'd like to thank uh, Niwad. Niwad actually gave us this Zoom platform. They partnered with us and they provided the, Z uh, the Zoom platform. That's the Nigerian Women in Agricultural Research, in Agricultural Research for Development. So I'd like to thank them immensely. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the people behind the scenes I've got um, Elizabeth who has been doing the admission and I've got um, Ife who has been, um, who has been showing up the, the slides and all that. So I'd like to thank them very much. I thank everyone who, who joined today. 
If you didn't join, then we'd be talking to the air. So thank you for showing up. Um, so what next after this? Uh, this uh, conference is actually a prelude to a program that we're having coming up at the end of February stroke the beginning of March. It's a careers fair for our students in secondary school, senior secondary school to be precise. We'll have um, people in different, um, different walks of life and in different uh, sectors and the children will be able to sign up to the different webinars to choose so that they can speak with people in those areas of interest. And um, they start to look at how they can develop and get into these sectors. So that's going to be the next. I'll be sending out information because it's still we're still in the development stage of that, but I'll keep you posted. I have your email addresses, so I'll keep you posted there. And you can also follow us on our um, uh, Facebook page at Saxon, at Saxon Foundation. So it's just at Saxon Foundation. You can follow us. I'll keep sending updates through that through that means. But as I said, I have your email addresses, so you can. So I'll send out the information for the students' um, uh, careers fair that will be coming up at the end of February, stroke the beginning of March. It, it, it's actually it's it, it actually has to do with the school calendar. So I don't want to clash with the school calendar. Now it's already been moved since the students have not resumed now. So depending on when they resume, then I'll be able to set a proper date for, for, the, for the next, uh, for the careers fair. And I'll send out information regarding that. Then another um, pro uh, project that I'm going to embark on will be um, uh, inf like what, what uh, Mrs. Olawoyin said, she said, if, you, if you're not keeping with the trends, if you don't have knowledge of the trends, you'll be left out. And so in the coming months, we're going, I'm going to start an information, something like to give information of what is going on in the economy. So for teachers, for parents, so that you can you you know what's going on, what is what the government is doing, how policy is um is is affecting what we're doing, how we can hold government accountable. <coughs> Because at the end of the day, we want our children to be able to either have jobs or create jobs. And we need to know what kind of policy is in place, what kind of policy is going to hinder us or is going to help us and how we can also hold government accountable so that our children are not left like in the, up in the air, you know? So our teachers and parents, information is key. Knowledge is power. So when you know what's going on as well, you can also direct the children. So I'll also give you information as time goes by. In, as, we, as we now come to the close, once again, I say thank you to every one of you here. Thank you to our panelists and our volunteers working behind the scene. Without our volunteers, we can't really do much. So I say thank you. Thank you to everyone who has turned up and I hope we'll keep in touch. Um, yes, and that's it. Uh, I would like to ask one of our panelists, actually, I'd like to ask one of our attendees. I'm seeing somebody, Dr. Bukola Aminu. Yeah. I would like to invite you to give us a closing prayer. Let us pray. Thank you. Father, we appreciate you this morning. Thank you. We thank you for the word of affairs that we had this morning. Thank you. We thank you as a parent and a teacher. Thank we thank you, you for everything. Father, we see the same glory, honor, and adoration in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank you for all the panelists, we thank you for the wisdom. We thank, thank you for the knowledge. Father, we pray that you're going to be with them and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. And as a parent, give us the grace to lead our children right in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And what we have learned this morning, let us put it to practice in Jesus' name. Amen. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bukola. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, everybody. Um, blessings to you. This is the new year. By God's grace, we'll meet again next year, but in between, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. God bless you. Thank you. More grace to you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh. 